uh, I would like to welcome my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Vineet Bandari. He's actually part of my textbook and we both wrote the chapter on BPD. But I have to say a few words about him because it is my duty to introduce him in the proper manner and not as a friend. So he was he has passed from Armed Forces Medical College, uh, Pune, uh, Premier Institute of India, and later did his uh, uh, post graduation in PGI Chandigarh, one of the pioneering institutions in India for neonatal uh, programs. Subsequently, he became uh, the head of department in Albert Einstein Medical Center, and later he became chief. Neonatal Prenatal Medicine Sense Christopher Hospital for Children and has got the latest uh, appointment is at uh, Division Head of Neonatology at Children's Regional Hospital at Pooper in uh, 2020. He has published a lot of books and out of it, three of his books are very uh, impressive. He has, been, has a book, a manual of neonatology and I really loved his book on bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And he's the author of another textbook, which I found very interesting, is Tantalizing Therapeutics in Bronchopulmonary Dysplasia. He's authored almost 300 chapters. And I was very happy to be, to have him as my main editor for my chapter on BPD in my textbook. So I now give the mic to my uh, Dr. Vineet. Dr. Vineet, please uh, entertain us and enlighten us with tantalizing lecture. Thank you, Rajiv. Um, I will uh, be able to hopefully, um, thank you, Rajiv, for the introduction and, uh, and uh, for the kind uh, you know, invitation to speak in this, um, in this symposium. It's a very nicely organized and uh, it's so great to see Dr. Sagar and Eduardo and Daniel and everybody will be, you know, Daniel will be speaking after me in about 45 minutes or so. Um, so let me see, I will see if I can uh, get my slides up uh, to share. Tafik, can you? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Let me first. I think. Um, let me go back. Sec, one second. Mm, and then I think share my slide that way. Share screen, I go here. Yeah. All right, can you now see my full screen? Yes, now okay, all right, great. Thank you so much. Um, and so today I'm going to be trying to talk about uh, ventilator management to prevent and treat bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And I'm going to try to make it very practical and you know, give you very specific uh, suggestions of how, to, how we manage babies. And obviously, we will have time for questions at the end the discussion section. One of the things that has uh, been, uh, been a problem and continues to be a conundrum, clinical conundrum, is the definition of BPD. Uh, but for the sake of this talk and for most practical purposes, I'll be using this definition, uh, which is a clinical definition using therapy as a marker or as a diagnosis for BPD. And for the babies less than 32 weeks, we make an assessment at around 36 weeks postventral age. Uh, if the baby's been taking, uh, been uh, being exposed to supplemental oxygen more than 21% for at least 28 days, plus at the, at the assessment time of 36 weeks, if his baby is breathing room air, then it's mild BPD. Less than 30% oxygen is moderate and severe if the baby requires more than or equal to 30% oxygen or any kind of positive pressure ventilation support, whether it is, um, uh, whether it is uh, invasive or non-invasive. Let me see now, it seems to have not moving the slide. The slide is not moving, Dustin. Uh, there we are. Okay. So the pathogenesis, this is a simplified version of the pathogenesis. You heard Eduardo give you a little bit of information about this, but I want to highlight a couple of things. One, that it is a combination of genetic and environmental factors. And genetic factors probably contribute somewhere between 50 to 70, 80% of to, uh, the risk to BPD. But the three major environmental factors is going to be ventilator trauma, especially specifically invasive ventilator trauma, 
infection, which can be prenatal or postnatal and exposure to high concentration of oxygen. So when you have these combination of genetic and uh, uh, environmental factors acting on a foundation of an immature lung, notice the fact that I put a plus minus sign in front of surfactant deficiency. And this is very important because you do not need to have surfactant deficiency or RDS to get BPD. It is the immaturity of the lung, it being in the late canalicular and early saccular stages that really makes a baby get into what is now called new BPD. And I'll show you a little bit of a more detailed slide in, in the next one. So essentially these factors, you know, acting on an immature lung leads to inflammation and, and that leads to cell death. And then you land up with a situation where the lung will try to heal itself and resolve the injury. It could be because of um, environment, it could be like stem cells, nutritional factors, and lots of other factors that could be playing a role here. And if you're able to do that, and luckily the lung grows, then you may get a reasonably normal lung as you grow older. However, if the lung gets so severely damaged and the reparative process uh, is not uh, is, is put into play, then you land up with a situation of impaired alveolar development and dysregulated. This is very important to realize that it is not decreased, but dysregulated vascular development where there are areas of decreased uh, vascularization as well as increased vascularization, which leads to an impairment of blood gas exchange. And that is your classic pathological feature of BPD. So to give a little bit more detail of what we now call new BPD, you have a list of prenatal factors here. Eduardo mentioned pregnancy into hypertension, hypoxia, infection, smoking is an important factor, antenatal steroid, lack of antenatal steroids, and other factors, as well as your, we will talk a little bit more detail about how we decrease invasive mechanical ventilation in an effort to decrease these forms of biotrauma which hopefully will also decrease these inflammatory cytokines. And hyperoxia plays a very important role in the pathogenesis of new BPD because of DNA damage, lipid peroxidation, and protein oxidation. Again, releasing, to a, releasing multiple inflammatory markers and, and factors, which leads to aberrant tissue repair and which inhibits vascular and alveolar development and leads to BPD. Um, so to summarize, uh, it is in terms of the pathogenesis, it's a combination of maternal factors, infant predisposition, that is the genetic susceptibility due to a variety of reasons, um, including the microbiome, which we have recently shown is an important player in the pathogenesis of BPD, mechanical ventilation, which is going to be the focus of the talk, and oxygen injury. So the classification of BPD, um, the older, older classification or one of the standard classification that people have used is four stages of BPD. And I'm just going to show you some uh, X-ray images of the four stages. But I will then go to a, what I like to call a more practical way of uh, looking at BPD and planning your management strategies based on that classification. So this is a stage one of BPD where you basically, essentially it's indistinguishable from respiratory distress syndrome. You see small lung volumes, reticular granular pattern, air bronchograms, and just like a baby with RDS. It moves to stage two, where it's around, say, I would say around the first week of life, day five to seven, where you have homogeneous opacification of lung, there's increased edema, and some increased interstitial markings with coarse confluent densities. Uh, stage three is more, you will start seeing some opening up of loosened vacuoles here. I'm um, appearing as air cysts, so just showing you how damage has been occurring to the lung and, and the body is trying to heal, but it actually goes into the re repairing phase rather than the healing phase. And then you land up with stage four BPD, which has this bubbly cystic appearance of the lung, as you see very nicely here in the left upper lobe. And, and then you have this uh, strands and shrieks in the lower zone showing you decreased uh, lung volumes and obviously a severe uh, impairment of blood gas exchange as when, as um, as obvious from the fact that this baby has the endotracheal tube and is being ventilated. So how do we start managing the ventilator management? Uh, and I think it is important to remember that obviously antenatally, it'll be great if we get steroids, antenatal steroids. That is probably the most important antenatal um, intervention one can do to try and make an effect, at least in trying to decrease the severity of lung injury or severity of lung disease right at birth though it has not really been shown to make an impact on BPD, but I still believe it is very important to get your MFM, maternal fetal medicine and obstetric colleagues to, to remember to give the baby antler steroid and preferably if they can delay the delivery for about 48 hours. So once you are born, what would be the next steps? 
Now, there was some hope that sustained lung inflation would maybe be helpful at the right in the delivery room, but right now, based on the latest data, especially from the SAIL trial, there is no evidence to support the use of sustained lung inflation. So at least in the next edition of this uh, chapter, this will probably will get removed. Then the issue comes up, how do we manage this baby? And I think there's a lot of data to suggest that if you do not need to intubate or and ventilate the baby, it would be great to avoid that. So you could do that by using CPAP, which is the more common method, or you could use a nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation, which I will talk about at the end of the talk. And But however, it is also important to remember, as Eduardo also emphasized, that if a baby requires a factant, you should give it, and you should give it early, which means preferably in the first two hours of life. Um, most of us, at least at least on our unit, we tend to use Insure, which is intubate surfactant, and uh, basically then extubate the baby quickly. Uh, and then when we extubate, we extubate the baby to nasal IPPV. I don't have the synchronized machines anymore, so I don't have SNP, but I do have an IPPV, and that is pretty much standard of care. Uh, and in the Cochrane review has also shown that if you extubate a baby, if you needed to intubate the baby earlier on, to nasal ventilation, you would probably get a better outcome uh, in terms of their risk, decreasing the risk of intubation failure. Now, if they do require intubation, one should obviously try the best to minimize the amount of uh, atelectrotrauma, barotrauma, and volutrauma, as I will talk about in a few minutes. And then we will hope uh, that these babies will, if you cannot prevent BPD, at least we'll try to get a less severe version of BPD. The important point of this slide is that an, eff an effort to prevent slash decrease the severity of BPD should start from birth itself because the first few days of life is very critical in how the process of inflammation develops and how you can try and prevent and treat BPD. These are some of the modes of ventilation. It's a, one of the slides that I used to teach my residents and fellows. You can see here, IMV stands for intermittent mandatory ventilation, SIMV is synchronized, assist control, pressure control, and pressure support. And we do believe that if you are going to be using uh, some type of pressure support or pressure control, try to use pressure support and use synchronized ventilation as the, as the giving the baby help and the baby is trying to breathe himself or herself, uh, we do believe that it seems to decrease the degree of uh, injury. Um, we routinely now actually use volume targeted ventilation. Um, and so in most babies, if you are not able, if we have to intubate and invasively ventilate the baby, we will go for volume targeted ventilation first. If that is not working out for the baby, then we will move to um, SIMV or pressure control pressure support ventilation. So how do we manage a baby when in terms of their blood gases? And this is one of the attempts to see what happens, what you can do to improve oxygenation. So there's a variety of techniques you can improve uh, oxygenation. You could increase PEEP. Now, again, it depends on how much PEEP you have started off with. We normally start off with PEEPs of around four to six, five to six centimeters of water pressure, and we will increase up and uh, to about seven or eight. There are institutions that like to go up higher, but we are a little bit more shy of going higher than eight, uh, especially in the smaller babies. I usually rarely go above seven because I'm concerned about the risk of air leaks. One could increase the peak inspiratory pressure or increase the inspiratory time. But if you do increase one of, or both of these, remember you're going to be increasing your mean airway pressure. And so you have to be careful that you do not exceed 12 uh, in the smaller babies, 12 centimeters of water pressure, or mean airway pressure, because that might also increase your risk of uh, developing air leaks. We could increase the rate, and that does not really improve the oxygenation that much. Um, um, so it is not really, really helpful. So these, the first top three, would be the most important ways of increasing oxygenation. Uh, increasing FiO2, a fraction of inspired oxygen, obviously will increase the amount of oxygen you're delivering to the baby, but you have to be careful because oxygen is a drug like any other drug and would have certain specific side effects in terms of oxidative damage. I tend to use the 40, 60, 80% rule, and there is data from humans as well as from the animal studies that these values probably should help you guide what oxygen um, exposure you should be given to the premature baby. If you are between room air and 40%, you're pretty much creating the same degree of damage in terms of the oxidative damage. Similarly, if you exceed 60 or you go beyond 80, if you're at 80 or 100%, it really doesn't make that much of a difference in terms of the degree of oxidative damage that you'll be giving to the baby. So once I reach the numbers 40, 60, or 80, I try to decrease the FiO2 requirement, again, maintaining oxygen saturation at a specific target, which I will also talk about. 
by increasing either the mean airway pressure through the top three mechanism, either increasing PEEP, PIP, or I time. My effort has always been to try to keep the baby's FIO to 40% or less, at the same time trying to keep the mean airway pressure at 12 or less. Um, and again, if I could extubate the baby, that would obviously would be the ideal situation. How do we improve ventilation? By that, I mean, how do we get wash out the CO2? We could increase the rate. We can increase the tidal volume, which as I mentioned to you, is what we tend to use uh, as a first line of invasive ventilation uh, in the smaller babies. And we usually target a tidal volume of four to six ml per kilogram um, in the first few days of life. We increase the, you can increase the PIP or decrease the PEP to improve your ventilation by increasing the difference between the PIP and PEEP, which will wash, help you wash out more CO2, or you could also increase the inspiratory time. The important thing when you're messing around with the eye, eye time is that you try to remember to keep the eye to E ratio as much as two is to one as possible, or one is to two be more precise. You want the expiratory time to be at least twice as long as the inspiratory time, because if you keep increasing your eye time and you do not give enough time for the baby to breathe out the CO2, uh, you can then uh, land up with air trapping and inadvertent PEEP development. So always keep in mind, as you, if you do go up on the I time to beyond 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, or 0.6, you are going to be shortening your E time. And, and that may not be an ideal situation. So keeping the ratio I to E ratio of one to two is probably the most physiological way of handling the, uh, the I to E time ratio. Here are a couple of suggestions of how you make adjustments on your ventilators based on blood gas analysis. Most of this is instinctive and all of you, most of you hopefully are aware of how to manage it. But again, the point over here is that if you're dealing with a situation, for example, hypoxia and hypercarbia, you can increase your peak airway pressure till you reach a certain level of mean airway pressure and try to keep it as less than 12 as much as possible. Um, in smaller babies, just increasing the rate might also work for uh, these two uh, blood gases abnormalities. And similarly, so on and so forth, obviously, if you have a low PaO2, you go up increasing the mean air pressure of FiO2. But once again, I would recommend that you focus on the 40, 60, 80% person rule in the sense that you try to keep the FiO2 less than 40, less than 60, less than 80 by compromising in terms of increasing the mean air pressure and vice versa to try to keep the degree of damage that you're creating in these babies with invasive ventilation. And as you go down the algorithm over here, you can see that depending upon where you are, uh, you may have to sometimes sit tight uh, unless you are ready to wean the baby. And when you are weaning the baby, obviously the effort is to try and get the baby to non-invasive support. And as your first choice of non-invasive support, I would highly recommend you use uh, NIPTV. And I will talk about that at the end of this talk. So I mentioned to you that I don't usually like to look at BPD in terms of stage one, stage one to four, because I don't find them very practical. So what I tend to do is I tend to describe BPD in three phases, which I find very in a practical way. I call it the early evolving and the established phase. The early phase is essentially the phase is from birth to one week of life, evolving space is from one week of life to about 36 postmenstrual age, and established phase is when you have <clears throat> beyond 36 weeks postmenstrual age. And these are the approximate um, values of uh, ventilator settings, invasive ventilation settings that we are trying to use. And you can see over here in the early phase, we try to keep the um, eye time somewhere around 0 0.3, 0 0.35, and then we increase it slightly in the evolving phase. And if necessary, we'll go on to the established phase, we'll increase the eye time even higher. I will talk about severe BPD to some extent, and Daniel will talk about it in more detail in the next talk. Uh, and we will, and I'll give you some strategies of how we handle established slash severe BPD too. A tidal volume initially, we would probably start around 4 ml per kilogram, and we do increase it slightly as you go up. Again, severe BPD is a separate category, and we will uh, talk about that in more detail later. The PEEP, I tend to use, like I mentioned to you, I rarely go above seven, even in the evolving phase, um, um, because of the worry I have of uh, air leak syndromes. Uh, for pressure support, these are the pressure support values we use, and this gives you some idea, of, depending upon the size of the baby, what pressure support values are recommended to try and minimize the degree of uh, injury to the lung. The blood gas target. So in the early phase, I am very happy if the baby has a blood pH of 7.25. 
I have no issues in trying to push the ventilator further. Um, and I keep try to keep the PaO2 between 40 to 60, 45, 50 is fine. And PCO2, this is PaCO2. So if you're giving, if you're doing capillary blood gases, please add uh, anywhere between five to up to you know 10 millimeters of mercury higher higher values to this. So it would be somewhere in the 60, 65 range should also be okay as long as the blood uh, pH is okay. So let me give you a bit of a strategy of how we handle babies who are around 23 to 26 weeks of gestation. So initially, we will start the baby uh, from the delivery room on CPAP around five to six. Um, if uh, Sometimes we also do NIPPV by using the TPs. And, and, and if the baby is requiring more than 20, 30, 30, 30 35% oxygen, we will actually intubate and give surfactant and we extubate to NIPPV. Once we extubate to NIPPV, we will try to keep the baby extubated and we hope if we keep the baby extubated and keep the oxygen requirement somewhat less than 30% or 35%, we may be avoiding BPD, or at least we can probably get into a state of mild BPD. If the baby uh, requires to be reintubated because of uh, apnea or because of uh, uh, atelectasis of the lung, then again, we focus on volume guarantee well, ventilation and try to prevent the mean air pressure from going higher than 12. Uh, if the baby's mean air pressure goes higher than 12, then we tend to use rescue. Uh, we use high frequency oscillator ventilation. We also have the jet in our unit. So depending upon if the ventilation is a problem, we will first usually focus on high fi oscillatory ventilation. If oxygenation is a problem and despite high frequency oscillation, then we might switch the baby to high frequency jet ventilation. Um, but usually if the baby is still requiring high pressures and oxygen at seven days of life, and especially if the baby has a hemodynamically significant PDA, uh, we will probably will not be able to avoid a uh, diagnosis of severe BPD. Um, the effort, uh, like always, is to try to extubate the baby to non-invasive ventilation. Uh, and when we uh, extubate the baby, we go to NIPPV. So the PIP that we, the setting that we use to extubate a baby will be 16 over five, rate of around 15 to 25 per minute, and I found out around 30.35. So once the baby reaches this setting, we will make an attempt to extubate the baby. Now in the evolving phase of BPD, this becomes more of a challenge because now the baby has been intubated or, uh, and not been able to extubate. And again, we try to make an effort of how we can optimize the management of these small babies. Um, and again, we are worried about if we can keep the baby extubated, that would be great. Because I think if we can keep the baby extubated beyond a week of life, even if it's like a 10 days of life or 14 days of life, I think we still have a good chance of the child getting mild BPD. However, if the baby gets into problems with infection or the PDA becomes a problem, then you may have to go higher levels of uh, mean air pressure going back and forth between uh, oscillatory ventilation and um, the either SIMV mode or vo volume guarantee ventilation. And then if that happens, you might land up with moderate to severe BPD during this phase. Uh, we, I tend to keep the, about the same pH uh, uh, targets uh, in terms of uh, the blood gases. And you can see over here, the PaO2 and PaCO2, I'm allowing the CO2 to be climbing up a little bit more. In the established phase, uh, which is obviously very challenging, uh, and we are dealing with most situations that the baby is gonna get moderate or severe BPD. And once again, the effort is to try and get the baby extubated, but if you're not, we tend to use SIMV mode. And then of course, we are also dealing with BPD spells and pulmonary hypertension. I won't talk much about pulmonary hypertension because that's a lecture by itself, uh, but I will talk a little bit more about how we do management of severe BPD to some extent. The blood gas targets uh, is about, as you see over here, allow a higher amount of PaO2. This is an effort to try and decrease or at least try to decrease the severity of pulmonary hypertension that these babies are prone to uh, because oxygen is actually a much stronger vasodilator than even nitric oxide. So trying to keep the PO2 high and, uh, and the targets of saturation also higher at this point. Let me talk a few words about BPD. You will hear a lot more about it uh, in the next talk, but this is just to showing you a picture of the cystic lungs and you can see this is really bad, bad lungs of a baby has bilateral cystic changes. Uh, and would be considered to be called severe BPD. And, and the problem with C B severe BPD is that it's a heterogeneous disease because there are certain areas 
where the lung is overexpanded and certain areas the lung is atlactatic. And so it becomes a real challenge to try and ventilate these babies. And uh, so here to give you an illustration of what I'm talking about. So here you have a situation where you have normal compliance or normal resistance and there are certain parts of the lung that have high compliance, certain parts of the lung is high resistance. As you can see here, there's, there's not enough um, gas exchange can happen because you're not able to even ventilate uh, this parts of the lung. And so you get into a landing, land up in a situation where you have worse distribution of gas, increased dead space ventilation, and higher PCO2s and higher FiO2s. And so to try and get rid of this problem, or at least try and ventilate these kind of lungs, we will try to have to use higher tidal volumes and longer inspiratory times. And some of the numbers that you're going to see may say, oh, that's a very, very high number for a small baby. But remember, these babies are usually beyond 36 weeks of just of postmenstrual age. And because of the lung disease being so severe uh, and the lungs being so, so stiff, um, that you, tend, you really will need these kind of settings to really be able to ventilate it. So for, for severe BPD, we will use peeps of six to 12. And I've gone up as high as 15 centimeters for some of the really bigger babies. Our tidal volumes are eight to 12 ml per kilo. Almost invariably, I am somewhere between 0.5 to 0.6 seconds uh, of the eye time again. Um, there is this problem of the CO2, which may not have enough time to be removed, uh, but we hope that uh, at least with the higher peeps, we will be able to wash out the CO2 and we give higher values of the pressure support numbers. So as I mentioned to you, there are two characteristic um, uh, phenotype of babies with severe BPD. One characteristic is a baby where there is um, a delectatic variety and the one that is overexpanded um, or hyperexpanded variety. So in this one, you have atelectasis and here usually we land up with more of an oxygenation issue. And so to try and counteract the oxygenation problem, we have to use higher peaks and look at the number that I'm quoting here. It will start around six to eight, but I will go up as high as 12 and sometimes even as 15 to try and get the oxygenation done in this child. Uh, let me just go back for a second here. And tidal volumes around four to seven per kilo. On the other hand, you're dealing with a baby which is overly cystic or overly distended alveoli. It's more of a ventilation issue. So we tend to go lower on the peeps and we keep the higher tidal volume to try and wash out the CO2 and allowing the CO2 to be as high as 65 mmHg PaCO2 as long as the pH is at least 7.25 and above. So to give you an idea for in a situation in the atlectic variety, we will use um, a tidal volume to four to seven, but we'll go up higher if it's required and uh, if it's of the other variety, then it's going to be mostly on the, um, uh, acting mostly on the, uh, uh, on the tidal volume. So this, let me give you um, a, some examples of how we have managed these kind of babies. For example, here you see a baby on the SIMV mode, settings of 26 over 11, and pressure support of 13, rate of 40. And you see the, the oxygen requirement of this baby is almost 100% here. And what we have done in this baby is we have increased. We can see the lung is collapsed, there's atelectasis and smaller lung volumes. And what we have done is we have increased the PIP from 26 to 30, increased the PEP from 11 to 12, and increased the pressure support. And then you are, we are able to decrease the FIO2 from 90% to about 87%. And the lung seems to be a little bit more open and definitely we had better gases. Uh, this is, uh, as you see, with the baby is improving. Uh, but this is another example where we have 26 over 10, we went up to 26 over 11. So just an increase of one value on the PIP, PIP was able to open up the lungs quite nicely and we were able to get the FIO to down from 95% to about um, 78%. In the ones that we are dealing with uh, the ventilation problem, we will tend to, uh, we will need to use higher tidal volumes and these are the numbers that we usually go for. And let me give you an example over here. You have a baby on 25 over five, rate of 45, I time, uh, sorry, tidal volume of 3.5 and uh, FIO 2.65. And what we did over here is we were actually able, because it's over distended, we decreased the PIP a little bit, kept the PEEP the same, and we decreased the I time to from 0.32 to 0.28. And we were able to decrease the FIO 2 from 65% to 45%. Another example, I can see over here, 20 over five and 40% FiO2 by able to decrease, and we, what we did over here is we went down on the PIP to 18 and we were able to get the FiO2 to down up to about 30%. So again, depending upon what the type of pathology or phenotype the babies have in severe BPD, we have to adapt our ventilator approach, ventilation approaches to these babies. 
The other problem, these babies have uh, BPD spells, and essentially they are bronchospastic cells, uh, and essentially because of the fact that they have tracheomalacia and bronchomalacia. And one of the key things about handling BPD spells is not to just go there and um, either bag, ventilate, or increase the vent setting, it's sedation. Um, we really need the baby to quieten down and, and relax so the bronchospasm is broken. And so sedation is the key part of, bron of uh, doing the breaking down, breaking, uh, breaking the BPD spells. Uh, we do increase the PEEP a little bit and make sure the eye time is up enough. And then sometimes we need to add some bronchodilators and keep the tidal volume around five to seven ml per kilogram. But I will highlight again that the key approach or the first step in a baby who is going through a severe BPD spell and is hypoxic um, is to sedate the baby so then we can get the baby a little bit better ventilated and oxygenated. So to uh, remind folks about when we do tidal volume or volume guarantee ventilation, with early BPD, we tend to use around 3.4 to 4 ml per kilo. With evolving BPD is 4 to 5, and with established BPD, we tend to go higher, and even, even higher than 6 ml per kilo if the baby is having um, the cystic variety of, or se of severe BPD. Um, it is important uh, regarding oxygen saturation monitoring at what levels uh, we want to target. So initially, you know, we, we were doing um, improved neurological outcome. The studies have showed 90 to 95%. At the lower values between 85 to 89, they have showed increased uh, mortality. So we tried to find a middle ground. And so right now in our unit, we, uh, our targets are 89 to 94%, and we keep our alarm limits at 85, 88 to 95%. And this is pretty much consistent till we reach uh, established BPD, and then because of the, of the concern of pulmonary hypertension, we tend to use slightly higher target ranges. Um, just to give you some uh, remind you of the strategies for uh, what we do to, for prevention or at least decreasing the severity of BPD, and then if you get established BPD, then how we try to manage. Here is a summary of the approaches. Initially, we use low tidal volumes and short inspiratory times, and then we adjust the targets And I mentioned. Uh, we are a little bit lower than this. We tend to do 89 to 94%. And of course, we allow for permissive hypercapnia. With established BPD, especially if you're talking about severe BPD, we will tend to have longer, larger tidal volumes and longer inspiratory times, and we will have to handle uh, the BPD spells. And again, we tend to use a little bit higher rates, uh, higher targets of the oxygen saturation, around 90 to 95%, uh, because usually the eyes are mature by this time, and we are concerned about pulmonary hypertension. So to summarize the invasive part of the management, uh, and I will talk about the non-ventilation strategies at my second talk, which is after Daniel's talk. But here, we tend to use, as I mentioned, targets of 89 to 94%. We avoid intubation as much as possible. If intubated, we give early surfactant, short inspiratory times, rapid rates, low PIP, moderate PEEP, and tidal volumes of three to six ml per kilogram. As much as possible, we try to extubate to NIPPV, and if the baby does well on NIPPV, then we go to CPAP. Here are our blood gas targets. Uh, we obviously use caffeine right from get-go uh, because of the fact uh, that it has been shown to decrease DPD. Uh, we, uh, we will talk about all of these factors later. In the evolving phase, which is from one week to 36 weeks, pretty much the same target for the oxygen saturation. A little bit permissive uh, on the CO2 over here in terms of our blood gas targets, but uh, we will make every effort to try to get the baby out, uh, get the intratracheal tube out to NIPPV, and pretty much the same for the methylxanthines, uh, i.e. caffeine. For the uh, nutrition is important. Uh, again, we'll talk about that in my second talk. Um, and here, um, for preventive pulmonary hypertension, we used um, slightly higher oxygen targets of 92 to 95%. And these are our ventilator strategies. I'll talk about steroids and other stuff in my second lecture. Um, if we are uh, not able to get the kid uh, on to off oxygen, we are able to send a baby home on oxygen. And this is just a list of seven factors that we look at uh, in terms of well, how we decide if the baby is ready to go home on oxygen. The baby has to be at least 36 weeks post menstrual age. Most of the, situ most of the time, the babies are closer to 40, 40 weeks of post menstrual age. They should have no acute medical problem, no apnea. They should be immunized. They should have a, a, an optimal weight gain of at least 15 to 20 grams per kilo per, per week. And they should have no ROP that requires therapy. And obviously, we will need a baby that needs to be um, monitored in terms of their monitoring system because they are on oxygen. 
we usually send a baby home somewhere around 0.5 to 1 liter per minute. Uh, and obviously, it is 100% oxygen when we send the baby home in terms of the oxygen um, FiO2. The mainstay uh, of trying to prevent, or if not trying to decrease the severity of BPD, is to get rid of the tube. And this is the strategy that requires the most attention because here it is not just the data in terms of how you do it in terms of the numbers, but also it, there is a lot of art to doing this. And I'm going to try to give you some suggestions of how we do it that might uh, be helpful for you as you manage these babies. So NIPPV is essentially giving CPAP in the IMV mode. And there have been lots of studies right in the 1980s showing that it decreased apnea prematurity uh, and of course, we had when we had the infant star, uh, we had synchronized, but we, at least in the US, we do not have synchronized NIPPV um, mode. How does NIPPV work? Essentially, it works by washing out the nasopharyngeal dead space, there's reduction of inspiratory resistance, it improves the stability of the chest wall, there's reduced work of breathing, it recruits the alveoli to open up the alveoli, so you establish a good functional residual capacity uh, and generate, um, and you prevent the collapse of the alveoli and by keeping them open. Now, there is uh, one of the modes of, when we had a synchronized mode of ventilation, of nasal ventilation, we had the Grace capsule, which was sensing the abdominal motion, and that would be synchronized with the baby's breathing. Um, we detected and synchronized <coughs> the ventilator with the baby's breathing. Uh, but we do not have that machine um, mode anymore. Uh, the other mode of synchronized ventilation by using NAVA, I will not talk a lot about NAVA. I think uh, Daniel will do uh, mention a, a more about NAVA. Um, and so I did not want to repeat uh, the substance of that. But basically what NAVA does, neurally adjusted ventilatory assist, what it does is it detects the, uh, the, effect, uh, the effort of the diaphragm and sends a signal um, back to the ventilator, and then that helps in synchronizing the baby's breathing. Um, I tend to use uh, two, uh, the nomenclature of primary and secondary mode of NIPPV, the primary mode being when it is used soon after birth, uh, which may or may not be within two hours, depending upon when you need to give surfactant. If you keep the baby intubated for a longer period of time, for days to weeks, then you go and you extubate to NIPPV, I call it the secondary mode. The reason I distinguish between these two is because the ventilator settings uh, recommended for both these numbers are different. So here are some of the settings. So when I'm ready to extubate the baby, the initial or primary mode, when you're bagging the baby or manually ventilating the baby, I usually will use a four centimeters of PIP higher than what pressure you're using to open up the lung. Uh, my initial peeps are four to six, then I will go up to seven, maybe up to eight if required. I try not to exceed these mean air pressures. These are my maximum values. I keep it on rate of 30 and I time of 0.45 seconds and a flow of 8 to 10 per minute. If the baby has been ventilated for some time, then these are the settings I need, 16 over 5 and about a rate of 15 to 25 uh, to get the baby to extubate. Once I'm ready to extubate, I will extubate to whatever mean air pressure the baby is getting the PIP. It will be 2 to 4 centimeters higher. Uh, and then, um, and again, these are the numbers in terms of the PEEP, the rate, and keeping the same uh, eye time. And again, I will try not to exceed um, the maximum value which I've mentioned over here. It is important to mention that all effort, effort has to be made to prevent air leak. There's going to be air leak, not only from if the prongs are nice, snugly fitting, that obviously helps, but the baby can open the mouth. So we make an effort to close the mouth, either by putting a pacifier or sometimes we'll put a chin strap. Um, and these are the initial settings, but we, we listen to the baby, we listen to in, in the axilla to make sure the air entry is good, we look at the chest rise, we look at the oxygen saturation, and usually within a, an hour or so I will get a blood gas and I will change or adjust the ventilator settings to make sure the PaO2 and the pco 2 are in the normal ranges as we have talked about earlier. So while these are the initial settings, I do increase the ventilator settings um, higher than if, if, if the baby requires them to be properly being oxygenated and ventilated. To give you an idea of what happens uh, when a baby is placed on NIPPV, here is an X-ray of a baby who had, um, was not on NIPPV, had been extubated on CPAP, and I put the baby on NIPPV. You can see very nicely the lungs have opened up. Most one of the important uh, differentiation thing that people talk about is when you compare NIPP with C CPAP, they said, "Oh, NIPP is just similar to giving higher CPAP." That is not correct. Um, keep in mind that yes, you are definitely giving higher mean air pressure when you're on NIPPV. That is obvious from the fact that we, you are using higher PIP. 
But what is important to remember here is that when you're doing NIPBV, you are intermittently giving this higher PIP, which means it is not that the lung is constantly exposed to a higher CPAP. You could use CPAP of eight, 10, or even higher, but I would be very uncomfortable with that because I'm concerned about air leak syndromes. But when I'm using NIPPV, I usually have you know, very rarely seen air leaks occurring on NIPPV is properly done because I do allow the baby's you know, PIP to come down depending upon the rate that the baby is getting. And so that is the intermittent increase in the peak inspiratory pressure, which keeps the lung open. And even if the lung tries to collapse, the alveoli try to collapse, uh, it, it will open it up again with the next breath. And I think that is why it works so nicely or so much better than just giving plain CPAP at a higher value. How do I do changes on the ventilation based on uh, whether the baby is hypoxemic or hypercarbic? You can see over here, I tend to either increase the eye time and I will increase the rate. As you can see, I can go up to 40 um, and I will increase the PIP uh, and the P8 is usually the maximum I use. Um, and the PIP, I have gone up higher, you know, 30 even, 30, 35. But keep in mind that when you're increasing PIP, it's not the number on the ventilator, but what is actually being delivered to the baby. And so it is very important to try and decrease the degree of air leak by closing the mouth and making sure that the um, nasal CPAP interface is properly placed. And you do not want the difference between the delivered pressure, the CPAP that, or the mean air pressure that's going at and what you're giving more than two to four. If you find that you're putting a number of 36 or 40 on the PIP, for example, and you're delivering only 20, it's not going to be effective. So it is very important to try and keep um, the air leaks, uh, the uh, air leak in terms of the uh, leaking from the nose and the mouth as, minim as uh, mi minimizing that as much as possible. Uh, obviously, please always remember to put an uh, orogastric tube, which is kept open to air to make sure that the distension of the stomach is decreased. Uh, because if you don't do that, if the stomach also blows up with air, besides the risk of perforation, there's also this pressure over the diaphragm from the, from the abdominal contents, uh, which will obviously affect your ventilation and gas exchange. So, so to just to summarize the model to reduce BPD, um, avoid intubation. If you have to give intubation, you can use uh, Ensure. Uh, hopefully, we will be using LISA, and then and next if the data looks promising. Um, and then if you're able to do nasal ventilation, keep on that. If you need to intubate, then try to do volume targeting. If it does not work, you can try synchronized IMV and pressure support ventilation. But like I said, there is sufficient data to suggest that volume targeting might be helpful. If the baby fails the non-invasive support, then we will try all of that. And uh, if again, attempts should be made to try and decrease uh, or avoid intubation. And the focus should be in the first week of life, I will say, more, more precisely, if you can keep the baby extubated between 24 and 72 hours of life, and we have data to support that, you just and, and try to prevent the baby from getting reintubated. And even if you do get reintubated, the risk of BPD definitely decreases if you have kept the baby extubated between 24 hours and 72 hours of postnatal life. So this is just summarizing uh, the prevention of BPD. Uh, minimize hyperoxia, as we talked about already, nutrition, preferably human milk and vitamin A. We will hear about that from Daniel as well as from me later on. Early extubation, I cannot emphasize that enough. Preventing infection, inflammation is a keystone in the pathogenesis of BPD. So if you can prevent infection, that helps. Kangaroo care helps. And of course, we try, if you are invasively ventilating, then we will at least try to decrease the biotrauma by all of these trying to decrease barrel volume and electrotrauma by the strategies that I have described in my talk. Uh, with that, uh, I'll be happy to take questions down the line. And if you want to read more about BPD, I would suggest uh, some of these uh, books and chapters. Um, thank you for your time.